and turn it to sodium chloride. Now we know that that's spontaneous. Uh, sodium actually burned in foreign gas quite spectacularly to form uh, sodium chloride. Okay. Uh, but when we look at how the pieces look together, we look and say, okay, well, um, ionizing sodium is exothermic. Um, sorry, endothermic takes energy. Sure, we get some energy back when we form the chloride ion. That's an exothermic process, energy is released. But to get chlorine atoms, we've got to break them up out of chlorine molecules. And that takes energy. Um, and when we add it all up, um, we don't have quite enough energy. Okay, so this is one of those cases where the numbers have to work, otherwise we're missing something. Okay, and so what we're missing, we know it's exothermal, we know it releases energy, and what we're missing is the fact that when you put that, say, a single sodium ion in a lattice, in other words, when you form sodium chloride, it is a lattice where you have sodium ions and chloride ions at very specific places, and when you look at a given chloride ion, um, basically it, is, it has interactions from a number of different sodium ions. And so each of those electrostatic attractions adds up, and it's that combination that basically produces the stability. Um, we call this the lattice energy because it's not just the attraction between one sodium at ion and one chloride ion, no. It's the attractions between one chloride ion and six different sodium atoms, sorry, sodium ions. One sodium ion and six different chloride ions. And you actually sum all those up. Um, ladies, actually, I want to address the gentleman around you. Um, do you find that conversation interesting? Okay. Um, so my policy is with this. You're adults. Um, I give you an incentive to come here and learn. Okay, and if you choose to, you know, play play computer games, whatever else, that's fine. It will come out in the wash. However, if it impacts the people around you and their ability to learn, I have no tolerance on that. Okay, does that seem reasonable? Okay. So, um, so basically, we call this the lattice energy, okay? and basically, it's this extra stability that comes about when you form a solid, and all those. Um, positive attractive forces start summing up. And so what you'll see with this, now this has some implications. What that means is, is that um, those ions are going to be in their places. Okay? The other part of that, of course, is that you also have a bunch of other repulsive forces that are further away, but the net, when you go through and add up all those combinations, all those um, uh, contributions, they basically sum up to basically being um, exothermic. So it's always exothermic, the slightest energy is always exothermic. Um, it turns out that we can sort of measure it indirectly. Okay, um, it does say it's measured directly, but that's not quite true. Okay, so that's sort of, this is one of those, this is a too good to be true statement. Um, the way it's actually done is, sure you burn sodium ion, sodium metal and chlorine gas, but you have to take away all those other pieces that sort of give you to, to leave the lattice energy. Okay. Um, so it's really calculated from knowledge of the other processes. Um, the other part is it turns out to be um, not so simple to calculate. Okay. Or, excuse me, what is the most stable lattice turns out to be quite a difficult calculation. Okay. So a priori, it's difficult to say, yes, sodium chloride is going to form a particular structure because there are a whole bunch of different structures. And um, there are literally hundreds of different ways of actually ordering all these um, crystals in the three dimensions. Uh, that's something that's covered in one or two. What I will say is it depends directly on the size of the charges and inversely on this. It's really just coulombs law. Okay, so typically what you have is if you have small ions, they can come very close together, so the distance is very, very short, and the attractive forces are very strong. And if you have large ions, and if they have the same charge, then now they're further apart, the attractive forces are weaker, and so typically this lattice mass energy is smaller. Um, the other part of this too is that obviously if you go from a cation with a plus one charge to a cation with a plus two charge, other things being equal, you've got twice the attractive force. 
<coughs> so typically what you'll see is for multiply charged ions, uh, these last forces are stronger, uh, which actually then plays into their physical properties. So let's see if, how well this picture actually works. Okay. So the first thing it says is that the position of the ions in the crystal lattice are critical to the stability of the structure. So what that means is that it's going to be difficult to move those ions out of their places because they're strongly bound and we're talking about the of the energy. So it says ionic solids should be hard. Okay. And for any of you who have actually touched a rock salt crystal or crystals you know, um, from geology, you'll see that actually they are pretty strong. <coughs> so these, these ionic solids are generally relatively hard, particularly in comparison to the molecular solids that we'll look at a little bit later. Now it also implies that if you displace these ions from their position, so imagine you're trying to break some of the, one of these crystals. It'll be very, very difficult, but once you move a plane, say, half the space away, in other words, where now <coughs> you know, some sodium ions have been surrounded on all sides by chloride ions, you've now shifted it so that it's now next to another sodium ion. As soon as that happens, you've got repulsive forces instead of attractive forces, and that basically is a cleavage plane. So what that predicts is that with those repulsive forces, um, these are going to be brittle solids. And that's exactly what you see. So basically, when you strike them with a hammer, okay, basically they'll, they'll shatter. Whereas if you do that to a metal, um, you know, typically the worst will happen is you'll, you'll dent it. So you see quite different behavior than metallic solids, which, which, are, you know, which are quite different. And then also quite different from molecular uh, materials, which behave in quite different ways. So, so this model actually works pretty well in terms of what you can actually um, recognize you know, in terms of physical properties. Now, the other things that sort of come from that is, again, this um, idea that these ions are difficult to move from their positions. Um, now, for say electrical, um, you know, for some to conduct electricity, you have to have something to carry the charge. That means either electrons or ions, positive or negative, positive or negative. For <clears throat> these ionic materials, yes, they've got lots of ions, so you think, hey, they should be good conductors of electricity. But what it turns out is that each of those ions is locked in its place. They can't move. And so, in fact, these are all insulators. They're very poor conductors of electricity as long as they're solid. <coughs> so, ion solids do not conduct electricity. That said, um, if you heat them up to high enough temperature so that the solid melts, you've got now a, literally a molten you know, a liquid that contains ions, very good electrical conductor. And now, you might say, okay, what do we have to do? Well, <clears throat> for things like bauxite, that's aluminum oxide, you go a couple of thousand degrees, okay, you've literally got molten rock, that's a really good electrical conductor. Um, and you think, why does that matter? That's how we make up, that's how we make aluminum, okay, which is a huge process that's carried out literally in molten rock. The other thing you can do is a lot of these ionic salts will dissolve in water. Okay, and as soon as you have those ions in water, they need to, that, that water will conduct electricity pretty well. <coughs> And again, that's exactly what we see. Compounds conduct electricity. Ion compounds dissolve in water, conduct electricity. And so we are sort of point out how that's done. <clears throat> so if you take, say, rock salt, put electrodes in it, okay, and there's no electricity flow, so the light stays off. You do that in, say, salt water, okay, and you'll actually start to see current flow. Um, make it saltier, like you know, dry, current flows in more easily because there are more ions to carry that <coughs> So these pieces actually all fit pretty well together. Okay? And so I think this, this is actually a pretty good it's a picture that correctly predicts a lot of the things that we can see. And that's even before we start with any sort of fancy microscopy where we actually look at the positions of the structure, um, just the gross physical properties um, that match. Now, so as I said, this is called uh, crystal lattice. Um, now, other things that come out of this is that if you take, you know, unlike, say, a water molecule, where we've got two hydrogens and an oxygen, okay, and they're clearly separate from 
everything else. <clears throat> when you look at it on a lattice, and you look, say, let's look, think about one particular core on an iron and one particular sodium atom, okay, um, each of the chloride so ions around that particular sodium atom are equivalent. Okay, so you can't really say there's any molecule. Okay, so in a very real sense, you know, an ionic crystal, or literally ionic substance, is as large in structure is as large as a single crystal. Okay, and you can make it larger by putting more sodium chloride on the outside to grow. Okay, so in that sense, um, you know, we don't really have an ionic molecule. It's, it's a whole, it's, it's a unit by itself. Um, and so a lot of times we're going to work with the empirical formula, okay, which is basically just the simplest possible formula we can have that correctly gives us the composition material. Okay, so we're really looking at the ratio of those ions a lot of time, and that's going to be proven based upon the charge. So, um, I think, let's go back to here. Uh, let's see if there's anything I missed. Um, Types of cations, and, which are different than metals, and ions which are non metals, to bound together by ion bonds. So, when we say an ion bond, uh, really that's pure electrostatic attraction. Okay? And typically, it doesn't have much directionality. It's, it's um, what we call spherically symmetric. So, in other words, if you have a chloride line here, the sodium lines have a given distance. The attractive force depends only on distance, not on position. Which is not true for molecular materials where they have a very specific bonds have direction. <coughs> um, yeah, I don't think there's anything here that we haven't already said before. Oh, okay. um, so apparently there's a popular need for something to call, talk about the smallest piece of an ionic material. And apparently the empirical formula just doesn't cut it. Um, and so we call, talk about the formula, the formula unit. Okay, that's the smallest electrically neutral collection of ions. Um, we talk about in terms of this formula weight, how much that weighs. And we sort of talk about it in terms of a sort of shortcut to describing the material. But keep in mind that formula unit is not like a formula of a molecule, where it's distinct and separate. It's just a, it's a convenience for us in terms of dealing with our materials. So the next thing we're going to deal with is there are an awful lot of these, and we have to agree on how we're going to describe them so we can literally speak the same language. <coughs> so uh, we're not going to spend that much time on organic compounds, which are predominantly com carbon. We have organic chemistry for that. Um, we're going to go through this. Let's see, the minimum amount of organic chemistry you have to get, what you have to learn to basically go out in life as if you, you know, pass this course. So carbon compounds are usually um, they usually contain with them hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, um, and there are an awful lot of them. And there are, it's literally 12 million and counting. It goes up literally every day. The rest of chemistry, which only basically you know, maybe describes a million or so compounds, um, is inorganic compounds. It's literally everything else. And so think of organic compounds as being the chemistry of carbon, inorganic compounds as the compounds of everything else. So your ionic compounds are mostly inorganic materials. I say mostly because, of course, life is more complicated. But for ionic compounds, the, na the naming of them is actually quite straightforward. You name the cation first, followed by the anion, and you truncate the name of the anion and add IDE. Okay? So, for instance, sodium and chlorine, table salt, is sodium chloride. Okay? So we take the chlorine. We take, you know, chop off the I and E and then we replace it with I, D, E to make it chloride. <coughs> now, here's where things get a little bit more complicated. It turns out that although many uh, cations come from uh, metals that have a specific charge, there are some metals that can have more than one charge. If you remember that we did the table with the you know, typical charges, and you had Group one, group two is okay. Groups uh, four, five, six, seven, and eight have typical charges, sort of. Um, all those transition metals, 
Now, we didn't say anything because typically transition rules will have a number of possible charges. And so we have to handle that. So we start with the easy one when a metal contains, when the first type is a metal whose charge is invariant, and that's going to be from one compound to another, so calcium is always plus two, magnesium is always plus two. Um, we're all adults here, we all know that magnesium has plus two, so why bother making that, you know, just putting that in the name? Much more efficient to say, oh, we know that magnesium is plus two, so we just say magnesium. And so we would say magnesium chloride, for instance, and we would know that magnesium is plus two, chloride is minus one, so that means the composition has to be one magnesium and two chlorines. So when we know the charge of the cation, it's easy. Um, when we don't know, then we have to actually name it. We have to say, okay, which iron it is, because it could be a number. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, here are the bells with the very cation charges. Okay? And you'll see that basically group one, group two, aluminum, and then zinc, scandium, and silver. Um, you know, zinc is always plus two, scandium is always plus three. Um, silver is almost always plus one. Okay, that phrasing is deliberate. Okay. Here's where life gets a little more complicated. Um, so, the good enough <coughs> is to say silver. Sometimes <coughs> you, you, you don't be sure, so you actually name and say which silver salt it is. Um, on the other side, for the anions, Fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodine, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, and phosphorus. These are all minus one, minus two, minus three, based on the group number. Very straightforward. They become fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, oxide, sulfide, nitride, and phosphide. So you see, in each case, you just basically trimmed the end of the um, name, okay, the gen of nitrogen. O, R, U, S for phosphorus, U, R for sulfur, oxygen, and so forth. Um, so the good news is, is that um, even the popular press understands most of these things, and so a lot of times you'll see some of these simple compounds are named correctly in the press. So that's the easy ones. Now let's look at some easy examples. Um, so uh, KCl, potassium. <coughs> Chloride. Okay, name of the metal, potassium, we don't do anything else with that because we know it's plus one. Chlorine becomes chloride because it's an anion. And that's sufficient because we know that this is plus one and minus one. So that's un unambiguous. Look, similarly, calcium oxide, uh, CaO, okay, it's calcium oxide because it's calcium ion plus two. Oxygen invariably minus one, sorry, excuse me, minus two, except we lost a couple of ex exceptions. So it's going to be oxide. Calcium oxide is totally unambiguous. We know exactly what, what the composition will be. I will point out that calcium oxide is one of those things that has a bunch of trivial names out in the real world. Okay, things like quicklime and so on basically are derived from this material. Um, but these people aren't chemists. So in some cases they are chemists. Okay, so um, <coughs> similarly, uh, barium chloride, potassium oxide, magnesium sulfide, potassium nitride, okay, all very much follow this simple pattern. So let's see if you're awake out there. Uh, this should be pretty trivial. <laughs> I'm not to put any pressure on you guys, but it should be pretty straightforward. seconds.
<coughs> where it turns out iron can lose two electrons or three electrons. And you'll see both compounds of both form pervasive, you know, you'll see a lot of them. Um, so for instance, in iron sulfate, this one here is plus two, and then this iron sulfate is plus three. And it would be nice to distinguish them from the name, wouldn't it? So the way we tackle those is we note their charge in the name. So the other place you can use this is for say things like um, lead, thallium, tin. Um, again, they will have um, <coughs> lead and uh, tin typically form plus two and plus four compounds. Those are typical you know, compounds that you see. And again, you have to have a solution. So here are, in fact, here's a pretty complete list. Chromium goes plus two, plus three. Iron goes plus two, plus three. Cobalt plus two, plus three. Copper plus one, plus two, etc. Well, mercury actually is, well, it's plus two, but there are two of them. And then you get mercury plus two. So this is sort of like mercury plus one, but it's a form of diamonds. Um, that, as I said, plus two and plus four. So here's some good news. Um, you don't have to use these names. These are older trivial names that sort of indicate if it's um, lead 2, it's supposed to be plumbus. Uh, if it's lead 4, plumbic. If it's um, iron 2, it's ferrous. And if it's iron 3, it's ferric. These are still prevalent in the older textbooks. My generation learned about them. Uh, the good news is that you guys only need to know enough about them that you look it up when you come across them. And then the rest of the good news is a lot of times you don't even have to remember what the possibilities are because this is not an exclusive list of possibilities. Instead of what we do is we name them by charge. So for instance, chromium Br3. So this would be, it's clearly chromium bromide, but there are multiple chromium bromides. And so what we do is we use the number of bromides to figure out what the charge must be on the chromium. Three bromides minus three. That means that chromium the compound being electrically neutral must be plus three. And so we would name this compound chromium three bromide. Okay, so literally say um, what the charge on the metal ion is. That's unambiguous. Now, generally, you will not be asked to do the reverse. Okay, that's why I said that. You could be given the molecular formula and asked to name the compound. That's kosher because the molecular formula tells you how many chromiums and how many bromides there are in there. That's what we just did. Uh, but you will definitely not in this class be expected to know that if it's chromium, oh, it's chromium bromide, probably it's chromium free bromide. Okay. Um, rather than chromium 2 bromide or chromium 6 bromide, because chromium has a bunch of different states. So, that's easy enough. Now, for the next piece of it, um, you've heard me mention a couple of times that there are polyatomic ions, and the bad news is there are, well, the good news is there aren't that many of them, but the bad news is they're pretty prevalent and you have to know them. So let's talk about where they come from. These are typically oxy anions. They're oxygen bound to a non-metal. And um, what tends to happen is that those polyatomic ions tend to behave as if they were a unit. Um, and there are, now unfortunately there are different numbers of oxygens, and so we have to name them according to the number of oxygens. So the thing we do with those is basically if there are two ions in the series, the one with the more oxygen atoms has the end of ATP. And the one that has less is IT. <coughs> if, on the other hand, you have more than that, okay, so examples of this are what we call nitrate and nitrite. Okay, so you see this is <coughs> nitrogen, it's, the, it's an oxide. From nitrogen, and this one is the higher, has a higher charge on it, so it um, has more oxygen in it, so it's the ATE ending, nitrate, and it's very prevalent. Ammonium nitrate is a fertilizer that you can buy in small amounts if you're a farmer, 
of your garden. Um, if it's large amounts, you, the FBI will be talking to you about that. Okay. Um, nitrite, okay, which is a little less oxygen, you know, is NO2 minus. So again, the ITE. The same um, sulfate, which is quite common. Okay, so this is like a large number of oxygens, small number of oxygens is sulfite. So that's sort of consistent. We do have cases where there are more than two um, polyanons with, you know, with different levels of oxygens. And those cases, um, these are typically going to be where you have a halide and oxygen, but you also have metals and oxygen as well. Um, so the, the rule there is that, you know, basically the most, one of the most oxygens is going to be per and eight, so the per chlorate. Um, the one with low that, with one less oxygen, is going to be chlorate, then chlorite, and the one with the least oxygen will be hypo. Okay, so hypo stands of course for lower, okay, and per, like perfection, is higher. You see the same with bromate, bromide, um, hyperbromate, and perbromate. So hyperbromite and perbromate. So you know, the good news is if you learn that sequence, the rest will actually make real, relatively good sense. And so what we do when we name these ionic compounds with these polyatomic ions, okay, we basically name them in the same way. So um, if it's a polyatomic ion running an uh, anion, uh, we still, you know, they still basically use the polyatomic ion name instead. So for instance, NaNO2, this is sodium ion plus nitrate anion. So sodium cation, nitrate anion, okay, so sodium nitrite, and that's unambiguous. So the sodium plus the polyatomic anion is NO2 minus nitrite. Okay, so hence sodium nitrite. So this is under thou shalt know this. Okay, I, I'm not, as you've probably heard, I'm not a big fan of memorization, uh, but you know, this is you've got to speak the language. So the most common ones you'll run into a lot in this class are nitrate and nitrite. We've well, seen those. Um, you'll run into phosphate, um, you'll run into carbonate, you'll run into sulfate and sulfite. You've already heard about hyperchlorite, chlorite, chlorate, and perchlorate. Um, let's see. So, where you have, let's look at in detail phosphate, which is PO43 minus. So again, you would also have other phosphates below that. But we also have other complications, which is that um, hydrogen phosphates are quite a common ion. Okay. Um, and so if we say have this with, say, calcium, it would be calcium hydrogen phosphate. Um, likewise, there's dihydrogen phosphate, so we're basically just naming how many hydrogens there are. Um, let's do the same with uh, here sulfate. Uh, but there's a complication, which is, is that uh, there's an older, I mean, old, older membership system, which would call what well, we now call hydrogen sulfate, which is a hydrogen plus a sulfate anion. Uh, but it's commonly called bisulfate, or it's hydrogen sulfate. And likewise, you'll see bisulfite. <coughs> and the other place you'll encounter this, and those who are down from med school, um, you'll, you'll encounter this very common, commonly. Um, CO3 2 minus is carbonate anion. Um, hydrogen carbonate is found very pervasively in the body, and that's very commonly called bicarbonate. And in fact, if you look at your home medication cabinet, uh, I'm sure you'll find a bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate, something else on the thing here. So again, it's an older name form on the very commonly. Uh, for the rest, chromate <coughs> and dichromate are very common laboratory um, chemicals, or at least chemicals that contain these. So I have no qualms about saying thou shalt know. And then likewise, permanganate is a reagent I think that you use commonly in pressure and chemistry. Okay, and then uh, that covers everything except, let's see, two more. Acetate, which is uh, from acetic acid, which is vinegar. And then down here, cyanide, okay, CN minus, very, very common anion. And then peroxide is, um, 
One of those things you'll come across, there are only a handful of compounds you'll see regularly, but hydrogen peroxide is a very common bleach. So for those, you know, um, we've ever, ever wondered how bottle blocks come around, um, that's peroxide. Okay. Um, and then um, the really only common cation, polyatomic cation, is ammonia, actually, which is actually ammonia normal. Okay, so ammonia is in H3, ammonia normal is in H4 plus. Um, so I won't expect you to know this table today, okay, but the link's not over yet. So let, let me show you some examples. Um, barium to sulfate. Okay. Barium, we know it's plus two. Uh, oh, and by the way, you need to know the charges on the anions. Okay. So sulfate is always two minus, sulfite, two minus. <coughs> nitrate, one minus, nitrite, one minus. Ammonium, plus one, cyanide, minus one, and so on. So here's barium sulfate. Um, here's potassium permanganate. <clears throat> okay, and you can see already that this is again that per form. So it tells you there are a whole bunch of manganese oxides. Okay. Permanganate, uh, manganate, manganite, <coughs> hypermanganate, and hypermanganite. Okay. Uh, the good news is that it's illustrated for that I don't expect you to know. Um, here's magnesium hydroxide, or on this one. OH minus hydroxide. Okay. Probably the most common ion you've ever run into. Um, here's the test of nitrate, NO3 minus. And then here's ammonium phosphate, okay, which is three ammonias, okay, each plus one, one phosphate, which is minus three. Yeah, given I just told you what phosphate is, I think this is a fair question. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. <coughs> um, three, two, and one. So ninety-two percent of the correct answer is yeah, he's doing better. Um, I don't know if you'll actually manage hundred percent this semester. Um, if I ask you, to, if I tell you, the question was, what color is the sky? What, you know, ninety-nine percent would say blue. But then somebody else who, you know, so I've, I've done that experiment. Okay, um, copper 2 phosphate. Um, phosphate is PO4 as 3 minus. So we need basically uh, 3 coppers, that's plus 6, and 2 phosphates, which is minus 6. So one last bit of the nomenclature, um, just we'll squeeze it in and finish after this. Um, a lot of these ionic compounds end up as hydrates. They actually have water that crystallizes with them. A lot of times we've made these compounds by dissolving the ions in water and then letting it either react and precipitate or just evaporate them. Okay, and so and it turns out that the number of waters with them 
changes the, the properties, um, and at the very least, it changes um, how much we have to weigh if we want a certain amount of um, these materials. Okay? And it turns out that some of these hydrates have multiple, some of these ion crystals have multiple hydrates. <coughs> so, but for those of you who, let's see, I think this is Greek, isn't it? Um, mono, dimetri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa. Okay, so those who have had a classical education, that's one through eight. Hemi, sometimes you have one water molecule shared by a couple of different ions, a couple of different formula units, which has to say hemihydrate. Okay. So for instance, calcium sulfate is half of water, is calcium sulfate hemihydrate. Uh, barium chloride is six waters is barium chloride hexahydrate. And copper sulfate, which actually you can buy at your local garden store, is um, copper hexahydrate, so it's copper sulfate hexahydrate six waters. That looks like a good place for we'll stop there. Uh, recitation this evening, and then Friday, uh, be prepared to show that you understand the new